There have been lots of attempts over the years to blend technology with the guitar. Going all the way back to the electric guitar, that was effectively the first implementation of technology to improve the instrument. But while that might be the case, there's been a lot of examples of technology making guitars horrendous for some people. So today we're going to talk about technology guitars and look at the five biggest failures of technology in guitars in history so far. You're watching Alamo Music TV. My name is Chris McKee with Alamo Music Center in San Antonio, Texas. You can find us online at alamomusic.com. Like I said, guitars, technology, it's potentially a match made in heaven or hell. It really all depends upon how it is implemented. And since the start, we have been trying as builders and consumers, musicians, to find ways of utilizing the best, newest technology to make the guitar a better instrument to play, or make it sound better, or make it stay in tune. It really all depends. And when that's successful, it makes a fantastic instrument. But when it's not, it's a commercial flop and serves as really material for a young YouTube channel who thinks it's funny. Let's talk about some examples of good technology. I'm holding one right here. This is the Fender American Acoustasonic Telecaster. They came out with a Stratocaster this year. We've reviewed this guitar, it's been very popular. And the reason that I think this and some other successful hybrid guitars are popular is a certain combination. It's technology used in what I'm gonna call the right way. Technology that makes the instrument better, improves the experience, and is easy to understand. It's basically kind of intuitive for the player, it's accessible, it's not overly expensive, it works. Uh, there's nothing really that's too complicated and will cause issues with this guitar. And so, it, we are able to utilize it. Think back to the dawn of the electric guitar. Now, guitars started as Spanish classical guitars. They've morphed over time into flat top steel string guitars, then arch top guitars. But as guitarists, historically, we have been fighting with our bandmates banjo players, mandolin players, the sax player, what have you. We needed more volume, and that came by way of electricity. By electrifying the instrument, utilizing a combination of magnets and wound wire, we were able to amplify the sound of those strings. And over the years, that was improved upon. Now, you might argue that in the 50s, with the Telecaster and the early Les Pauls, that the combination or the recipe for a solid body electric guitar was really solidified. Every guitar since then has followed a very similar recipe for success. Pickups have adapted over the years. We've had single coils and humbuckers and P90s and whatnot. Nowadays, you have Fishman making their Fluence pickups with an entirely new way of making it, and yet the principles are still the same. Meanwhile, there have also been lots of attempts to utilize technology to improve the guitar or augment the experience of playing the guitar, what it sounds like, and a lot of those have been failures. Most of the reason why those have been failures are it solves a problem we don't really need solved. Most competent guitar players can tune their guitar. Thank you very much. Um, maybe it solves it, but not really. The process of fixing an issue introduces its own issues, or it's not very convincing. It brings along with it sounds that don't really relay the sounds that we want from the guitar. In fact, if you want a synth sound, typically you would use a synthesizer. And finally, sometimes it's just poor implementation, not understanding what the guitarist wants. We are a curmudgeonly lot after all. And yet you can look at other guitar manufacturers like uh, Ornsby or um, Kiesel and look at some of the new designs that are coming out, Tosa Nabasi's guitars. There are guitar players who will embrace the new, the different, if it means that it's a better instrument. So we're, it's not just simply because we tend to be a curmudgeonly lot. We want things that work the way we want them, and if it's too overcomplicated, if you have 30 knobs and five switches on the top of the guitar, or you make me turn it over and put a card that I have to keep with me at all times in the back of the guitar in order to change the sound, you've lost me from the start. I'm looking at you, Fender. So, without any further ado, let's talk about, in my opinion, the five biggest fails when it comes to blending guitars 
and technology. Okay, we're starting our list of the biggest guitar technology fails off with number five, the PVAT200. The PVAT200 represented one of the first commercial applications of auto tuning in a guitar. Now, the system was described as a combination of analog and digital auto tuning, which meant that there was analog tuning, changing of the actual pitch of the strings, and this was coupled with a digital system to model through DSP processing the sound that the guitar should be making when perfectly in tune. Now, the combination here in the recipe was one that was basically doomed for failure from the start. PV took a middling guitar and added technology on it to bump the price up to $1,000. This was back in 2012. The system left a lot to be desired. Digitally, at the push of a button, you could drop the tuning of the guitar but it didn't really drop the tuning of the guitar. The tension of the strings stayed the same, and digital modeling made the guitar through the amp sound like it was in a different tune. You couldn't really make it go to higher pitch unless you utilized MIDI editing that was available through the guitar. All in all, if you had the guitar at a low volume and you were practicing, and you had a different uh, tuning than what you were actually playing through the guitar, you had an acoustic sound that didn't match your digital sound. It also did not play well with vibrato, and bending. We actually utilized this guitar at one of our Guitar Wars competitions, and one of our longtime uh, friends and instructors played that guitar on stage during a performance, and each time he bent the note, the digital system wanted to just put it back in tune. For those of us who might play blues, that's really not what we're going for, PV. You can still find these guitars available, but good for you, they're not $9.99 anymore. They're $2.99, and uh, for good reason. I activate open E tuning. Then I can go back to standard tuning. Just like that. So, there you go. We're going to talk about auto tuning again, don't you worry. Number four, the I. <laughs> Number four. The Ibanez R. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> RGKP6, Josh. Number four, the Ibanez RGKP6 with built in Korg Mini Chaos Pad. Yeah, that's right. This guitar came with a Chaos Pad built into it, but not really built into it. The Mini Korg Chaos Pad basically had an area of the body that had been molded or carved out to accommodate a uh, place to mount the pad and it then wired into the guitar uh, with small connections. This was meant to give you the option of utilizing your fingers while playing the guitar to manipulate the sound with the chaos pad, create different effects, bending effects and whatnot. Um, it was otherwise a base model RG guitar with one pickup at the bridge position going through a pad that utilized batteries connected, disconnected, and could be completely lost, leaving just a Korg Mini Chaos Pad shaped hole in the side of your guitar. Now, the effect for someone who was really good at it could be impressive. You could play the guitar and then manipulate the sounds of that guitar through the chaos pad. For the majority of the buying public who would be looking at this guitar, it was confusing, parts could get lost, the system was not exactly ideal. Getting the chaos pad to cooperate correctly with the guitar posed its own set of problems. All in all, it basically committed the cardinal sin of giving us something we didn't ask for and then making it difficult to utilize when we tried. Number three, Fender personality cards. Never heard of them? I'm not surprised. So, back in 2013, 2014, Fender tried to augment their Fender Deluxe series of electric guitars with 
personality cards. What are these personality cards, you say? I'm glad you asked. They were basically circuit boards that fit into a slot on the back of the guitar that was covered with a plastic hatch. As you opened this latch up, you basically you installed the card and it changed the wiring of the pickups. Now these cards had different names to them, like Slicer, I believe, and other things. And you were supposed to get a zippered faux leather pouch that you kept all of your personality cards in. Now the idea was that if you went to a gig and you had your Stratocaster with three uh, noiseless single coil pickups and you needed a different sound than what you had, you would just pop out the personality card that was in your guitar, open up your pouch over here on the side and pop in a new personality card to fit with whatever top 40 band you happen to be playing with that weekend. Now, if you wanted to change during songs, it was very easy. Sure, no problem. You just flipped the guitar over, popped out the personality card, and popped the new one in. It all sounds overly complicated, and again, something we didn't ask for, and you're absolutely right. Now, I will hand it to Fender in the fact that they tried to deliver something that offered a lot of versatility in an electric guitar without having 30 knobs and switches on the very front of it. No push-pull pots and all of these things, granted. But at the end of the day, do we really need a guitar that makes every single sound imaginable? I mean, as a retailer, I just want to sell you another guitar anyway. But the fact of the matter is, none of us want to take to a gig our wallet full of personality cards for our guitar. And thankfully, it's just a distant memory now. Number two. <laughs> Y'all might think this is gonna be number one, but we got something special there for you. Number two is Gibson Auto-Tune Anything. Now we're gonna start at the beginning of this debacle that Gibson Guitar Corporation tried to put upon the public, which started with the Firebird X and the Dust Tiger. That's right, the Dust Tiger. Did you forget about the Firebird X and the Dust Tiger? You might have forgotten about the Dust Tiger, don't worry, we're gonna remind you right now what this very interesting Les Paul looking guitar had. And the Firebird X should be in your recent memory because, well, let's just say chaos ensued on the internet when a video went viral of Gibson destroying, through the use of a uh, backloader tractor, a bunch of Firebird X guitars lined up. Now Gibson has gone on record as saying that these guitars just weren't suitable. They couldn't be given to schools. They couldn't be used anymore as instruments. There was no way of saving them in effect, um, so they had to be destroyed. Now this, these guitars couldn't be saved, a lot of people suspect, because they came with a proprietary $250 battery. And that battery would eventually go bad, you'd have to get rid of it, and. You couldn't get another one at this point anymore because the guitar was that much of a commercial failure. Now that guitar and the whole line of robotic guitars represented something that Gibson was trying to, tr uh, trying to do very similar to what PV was doing. And that is to solve a tuning issue that most of us don't have through actual analog robotic tuning and the use of technology to change the tuning on the fly through this, the movement of a knob, you could have the guitar retune. In theory, it sounds great until you realize that the rest of the neck is actually wood. It's going to change as the tension on it changes. There's gonna be a settling in period the nut oh, at the top of that Gibson neck. Yeah, strings may still get bound in that and on and on and on. In fact, it's something most of us didn't ask for. And it created technology in the guitar that really set it for a specific period of time and there's nothing you could do about it. Now, Gibson did did somewhat improve upon this by moving to the G-Force, first mini G-Tuners, if I recall correctly, or mini E-Tuners, and then the G-Force Tuners, that took that whole system and put it just on the back of the headstock in what was thankfully a removable piece. So if you have one of those guitars where all of the controls are in there, good news, you can swap out your tuners. <sighs> but then, because none of us were buying these things, Gibson decided to just make it across the line in 2015. It's a big reason that the company then went bankrupt, which at the end of the day was the best thing to come out of the whole debacle because we got new leadership and now new guitars and a healthy company with not a single bit of robotic tuning uh, mechanism anywhere to be found. So hopefully Gibson's learned its lesson and we won't be revisiting that anytime soon. Number one, we've saved the best for last, that is the Synth Axe. 
If you are not familiar with the Synthax, this was a technological marvel introduced in the mid-1980s that was a combination of a guitar and a keyboard, all shaped like a guitar, to act as a MIDI controller with a high-end synthesizer workstation attached to it. In effect, this isn't really a guitar. It has some strings on it that really act simply as part of the controller function, both in the plucking and the fretting standpoint. It also had keys and pedals on it that allowed you to manipulate the synthesizer sounds, but the instrument didn't make any sounds on its own. It required the workstation that it plugged into via MIDI in order to track everything that you were doing and create the sounds that you utilize the editor in the workstation to create. Now, Alan Holdsworth and some others played these, but they were extremely expensive. How expensive? Mid-1980s, 13K, $13,000 for the Axe FX or, or the, uh, the Synthax and uh, its workstation. It's a lot, but only with this could you make a sound like this. <laughs> And this one. This is important in your next song. Check it out. And I know you've been missing this in your electric guitar performances. You want to do this. I know you do. How about this? All in all, the synth axe was a synthesizer. It, it was just like the synthesizers of the day. It had the same technology that was in a lot of those, only it was in the shape of a guitar. It was made for a guitar player who couldn't learn to play keyboard to have the access to synth stuff for this paltry sum of $13,000 along with the controller that you had to cart with you everywhere or you were out of luck. So in the mid 80s, if you wanted to be in maybe a cutting edge band and play the synth axe, you could also drive to your gig in your DMC-12 from DeLorean. Nevertheless, it was a commercial failure, mostly due to the fact that it answered a question nobody really had, which is how can I make my guitar do a salsa whistle? Sounds weird, but it's actually a very useful and interesting effect. It also cost $13,000. And so for someone who actually wanted to have something like this and experiment with it, perhaps it was out of reach for most people. It was, in effect, one of the best examples of how not to do technology in a guitar. And that brings us to the end of our video and the lesson that hopefully the public and manufacturers and publications alike have learned from this. And I include publications for this reason. When all of these instruments came out, almost every guitar magazine out there was talking about the praises of these instruments as they are the next, the best thing since sliced bread, the next incarnation of a 52 telly, the thing that's really moving the guitar forward. But there have been, as we saw, some good examples of technology used in guitars. When it serves the musician, it actually solves a problem or prevents, presents us with options we've already been looking for. It's intuitive, meaning easy to use. It actually works as implemented, and it doesn't cost a fortune. If those things are implemented, the technology works. When they're not, well, you got failures on your hands. That's my opinion anyway. If you have some examples of guitar technology failures, comment below, let us know what we've left out of our list of five. At the end of the day, we wanna help you find the right instrument. So if you are new to this channel, make sure that you subscribe, turn on notifications, like our videos, and uh, we'll keep making them for you. See you next time, thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.